So this is uh, our NXP session for capacitive sensor designs. So my name is Ravi Shah. I'm applications engineer with NXP Semiconductors uh, based in San Jose. And I'm going to talk about today about our capacitive sensor solutions uh, that can be used for proximity or touch-based designs. And what are some of the, in general, and I'll address, what are some of the good practices for doing any designs with uh, capacitive touch uh, kind of the technology. OK. So, so let's get started with uh, capacitive sensors. Now, just to back up a little bit, before I actually get into capacitive sensors, um, you know, there are primarily two types of sensing, you know, resistive sensing and capacitive sensing. And, and how many of you are familiar with resistive and capacitive and differences between both of them? OK, pretty much everyone, so that's great. So we'll focus today on capacitive sensors. I'm not going to go in detail of resistive technology. And, and before I go into the design considerations, good design practices, I'm going to talk about a couple of NXP devices just to set the background, and you have a reference point of what kind of devices I talk about. Because even within capacitive touch technology, there are multiple different types of devices, as I'll show you. But in general, why do we use capacitive technology? So the idea is to make designs you know, more user-friendly, where there is no contact required, in general, you know, a lot of the older designs used to have mechanical buttons or sliders kind of thing, which tend to break. They have more environmental effects. You know, they get rust, and they deteriorate over a period of time. These kind of problems are, can be avoided with capacitive uh, uh, designs in your, in your product. Where used, so the, the opportunities, the places where you can integrate uh, capacitive-based designs are you know, pretty wide. Uh, anywhere from your portable devices, whether it's a portable consumer, portable medical devices, some of the industrial applications. You know, automotive is a big one. Nowadays, you are seeing a lot of your front desk in your cars come, uh, supporting touch technology. So touch and capacitive-based touch is a pretty growing area, and the applications for this are pretty wide. Why NXP for some of these uh, potential solutions? because we provide some of the more configurable and lowest power uh, devices in, in their class. So let's, let's look at some of these in, uh, in, in a little bit more detail. So there are multiple types of uh, uh, devices by which you can enable touch in your design. You know, some are standalone device. Um, some are like an integrated microcontroller. So some are like a microcontroller devices which supports touch uh, functionality where you can write your code and, and, and do a touch screen kind of design. What I'm going to talk here about is focus on these three things. So a single channel device, a dual channel device, and a multi-channel or an eight channel device. So if you look at the single channel device, uh, it has only one input and one output, and it's a standalone device optimized for low power application. So when I say it's a standalone device, it means it does not require any microcontroller support for it to operate. But since it's a single channel, the applications for which you can use this are you know, something like replacing a simple mechanical button. Say you have a product which has an on-off switch, and it's a mechanical. Now, if you want to make it capacitive, you can use this device to convert your switch, to, to implement your switch as a capacitive uh, uh, switch. It's a single channel, and you don't need micro because it, it can work on its own. So it will detect the change of capacitance and it will switch the output either 1 or 0, high or low, and there you have your switch functionality. You don't need to write any code. You don't need any host microcontroller or any master for that sake. So it's a pretty simple application. Dual channel device is basically you can support two channels with similar standalone technology where you do not need to write any code or, or, or you know, write any software. And then you can have a multi-channel device, which is our eight-channel device. So as you can see here, uh, it has eight channels, but because of the, the algorithm built in to read these channels, you can, you can enable up to 28 sensors using this, using this uh, uh, one device. So you can crisscross four over four, and each particular intersection has its own unique identity. So you can actually have up to 28 sensors. Uh, you can implement 28 sensors using this one device. Now this one, as you see, has an I squared C interface. So it does require some sort of microcontroller support or some sort of master, which, which it's going to talk to over I squared C. But the benefit of I squared C is it's, again, a, a simple code to write. The, the complexity of the software is not pretty high. And it's a simple and easy way 
to manage such high amount of sensors using one device. So this kind of gives you a flavor of different types of capacitive touch sensors um, that, that, can, that can be there. So starting from a simple single channel, you know, standalone device, which is very popular on portable applications because there is no space for a bigger device or you may not want to just include a microcontroller or a micro resource in your design to enable a simple touch like doing a simple button or a, or a, or a slider or that kind of functionality. So, so I already talked about, gave you a, a brief introduction of our single channel device, but as you can see, it's a, it's a fairly standalone device. Um, you just need your hand, and the same device, by the way, can work as a proximity sensor too. So not only it can do touch, but it can do proximity as well. And the reason is, again, capacitive-based proximity sensing is nothing but the same thing as detecting the difference in capacitance. So if your threshold capacitance is very sensitive, if it's low enough, even a change in capacitance by an approaching hand will be enough to trigger that difference inside and you'll detect your proximity or an, or an oncoming object, right? So the same device can be used for touch applications as well as to generate, uh, to implement proximity as well. And the same applies for the single channel, dual channel, and eight channel. So for, say, a dual channel device, one channel you can use for touch, the other you can use for proximity as well. It all depends on how you tune your capacitances. And that is, where we, that is what we are going to focus on moving on, that what are some of the key parameters which drives this design. So for example, in this particular device, you see a couple of external capacitors around this device. And these are the capacitors that determine the operating conditions, like how fast it's going to scan, you know, how, how much of difference of capacitance it needs to generate. What's the threshold of the capacitance? All these parameters are decided by the external capacitors that you, that you attach to this device. And, and that's all what it takes to make a simple touch or proximity sensor. This is the dual channel device that I talked about. And this is the, the four channel device that I'll talk more a little bit later on to show how you can do 28 uh, touches. Okay, so this is how we got 28 touches using the eight channels. So every single intersection is a unique touch point. So for example, sensor one is connected to channel one and channel two, while if you see sensor 19 is connected to channel four and channel five. So every single intersection is, is, a, is a different sensor point. Okay, so moving on. So uh, the, all the sensors that I showed, they support auto calibration. And, and so what do I mean by auto calibration or self calibrating device? So this is an important feature in any device because what it does is it will, it will not detect a very fast response or a very spurious small mm -hmm. response. So, and the reason, the way it does it is, it, it monitors something for 63 steps. Only after it detects 63, 63 successful changes, then it's going to flip. So that way it avoids all the spurious responses. So here, as you can see, there was a big spurious response, but nothing happened to the output because it was too quick. And then, suddenly things started changing and it went all the way up to 64 cycles inside. That's when the output flipped. So this is called auto calibration or self calibration. And what it means is, over a period of time, you know, say a dirt accumulated on your board and all those environmental factors will change the reference capacitance, but that will be ironed out because you're only gonna react if you continuously see a certain amount of change. So this is an important feature uh, 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 in, in any touch or proximity sensor. If your solution does not support auto calibration or self calibration, Every time you will have to power it off and turn it back on to reset your base capacitance to calculate the difference. Right. <clears throat> okay, so let's go over some of the design considerations, some of the parameters that uh, are helpful when you're doing a design uh, around touch sensing. So this is as simple of uh, uh, an application diagram as you can get for a touch. So I'm showing a sensor plate and a ground plane and your, your touch sensor. So there are three primary cap capacitances which comes into play. The capacitance between your sensor and ground, the capacitor between, your f between the finger and the sensor, which is actually going to create the difference, and also the capacitor, uh, uh, capacitance between the finger or any oncoming object and, and ground. So these three 
are the primary factors which decide how your sensor is going to play out, what kind of sensitivity it's going to have, and, and what kind of change in capacitance it's going to detect. So let's start with the steady state capacitance. And this is basically your, your input capacitance, which is there because of your external capacitance that you might have designed in, the, the type of layout, you know, the traces, the size of the sensor plate, the size of the ground plane, uh, you know, the slow changing environmental conditions like dirt and things like that. This, all of these parameters uh, establish your steady state uh, capacitance. So for example, uh, for NXP devices, they could be anywhere between 10 and 60 picofarads. That means the input capacitance, the steady state capacitance, needs to be at least 10 picofarads for, it to, for the device to at least work. So similarly, all devices have certain range that they need to support for steady state capacitance, right? And then you can work on how much it's going to change. So that's one primary factor to begin with. The next question is, how fast you are going to, what is the speed uh, which you are going to support for an oncoming thing? So for the approach speed, this is a very critical point that a triggering object, you know, moving at a constant speed is going to cause more change in capacitance near the sensor compared to when it's further away. So for example, say this is the change in capacitance that I created, but I'm very near to the sensor while to create the same amount of capacitance change, I need to go this much more distance to create that same amount of capacitor change, as capacitance change, right? So this is an important thing to keep in mind when you are designing uh, uh, your application. The next thing is ground. So how does, what role does the ground play uh, in a design? Especially depending on the the overlay. You know, all designs have certain kind of overlay. So now, thicker the overlay, the more ground, the more gap you need between the ground. So why? So here I'm showing you uh, the electrical field, you know, which is generated by the capacitance. So this is my sensor plate, and this is kind of, say, the range of my electrical field. And when I'm going to come in that field, it is going to start to react, right? If I put two ground planes next to it, see what happens to the field. The, my range suddenly dropped quite a bit, right? So if I have ground, if, and, and if I have ground planes around my, my sensor plate, and if I have a very thick overlay, it may not fall within my, my range, and suddenly the, the, the whole experience is not going to be very good, or your capacitance may not be detected, your touch may not be detected. So if you have a very thick overlay, you need to have a larger ground separation for, for, for basically reducing your stray capacitance, right? So ground is also very important when you are doing a design. The next thing is the dielectric and the, uh, between the overlay and the, and the sensor. So uh, who, I'm sure everybody knows the, the permittivity. What is, what is permittivity? Anyone? of any material, what is the permittivity of a material? How well it conducts to electricity, how well it conducts the field is the measure of, of uh, uh, and that measure is known as permittivity. So the relative permitti permittivity is set by air, so we say air is one and then everything else is around based on air. So like glass, FR4 have much higher conductivity or permittivity uh, than air itself. So air is pretty bad basically. It, it's gonna conduct the least compared to any other material. And your capacitance is determined by, you know, a standard, like a, this is a math standard, epsilon zero, which is uh, like a permittivity standard times the permittivity of your material and inversely proportional to the distance. So the more your distance, the less your capacitance. So this is the basic formula which will help you derive uh, the capacitance based on the overlay material uh, and the dielectric between uh, the sensor and the overlay. Now, this is another aspect as, uh, which I just talked about, air gap. In most applications, there is an overlay, but the actual sensing PCB is not near the overlay. It may not be at the periphery. It may be sitting way inside, like on your phone. The, the sensing plate, the sensing PCB might not be directly connected to the glass. It may be further away. So in that case, in order to still have a robust detection, you might need to use some sort of conducting foam or spring or a flex cable which will transmit your touch or that change in capacitance all the way to the PCB. Otherwise, if there is just air, you may not be able to detect. Right? So it's very important that you make sure 
that your sensor and the PCB actually is receiving the signal from your overlay uh, layer, depending on the gap between those two, right? Then traces. In all PCBs have traces, and they play a significant role while doing the design around this. So for example, uh, for a 0.3 mm wide trace, uh, you know, it's 0 0.09 picofarad per mm. And suddenly, so if you have a 100 mm uh, kind of trace, you are looking at 9 picofarad, which is a significant amount of capacitance when you are trying to detect a change in capacitance because you already have your basis established for your device. Right? So basically doing uh, how you are routing your trace, the size of your trace, the distance between your traces uh, is also a very important parameter when you are doing your board layout with capacitive uh, uh, sensor. So for reference, in our sensor plate with uh, 10 mm diameter on an FR4, and uh, uh, sorry, not diameter, but which has a 10 mm difference between the FR4 and ground has about five picofarad capacitance, just, just a reference. So just to summarize, I mean, I just highlighted some of the key parameters that you should be looking at when you are doing your design. And of course, you can find much more detail uh, on each of these parameters. But to summarize, these are some good design practices when it comes to layout. So you know, it's, 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 it's good if you have a two-layer board. Um, also, a hatch ground, uh, instead of a solid feel, uh, you know, like a solid lump of ground, is more helpful around your, uh, around your traces in order to reduce the, the parasitic uh, uh, capacitance. Um, also, all other components other than your sensor should be mounted on the other side, because that will reduce your electrical uh, interference. Right? So I have this another LCD-based uh, uh, design where you can see uh, this is an LCD. It's a much complicated, it has an NXP microcontroller, uh, NXP capacitive sensor. Uh, if I plug it in, it, it, it actually has a demo of like a front panel of a car where you can set your temperature, you know, increase your temperature up, down, but it will show you that how everything is, all the other devices on the PCB are on the other side of your uh, sensor. Eventually, you need some sort of button as a sensor, right? So what are, even this can affect your design because it's the sensor plate. So, you know, the best shapes are like round solid, and that's what you will typically see in a, in a capacitive design or a capacitive interface. So those are the best. Uh, you know, square is okay as well, but, you know, uh, more sophisticated shapes, you know, which also has like, you know, shapes within it or, you know, which creates some sort of gap within it, are not very recommended because they are not going to be very effective in, again, doing what they are supposed to do to, to detect the change in capacitance or actually uh, get the touch on it, right? So it's best to stick with like a round or maybe a square kind of uh, button as, an, as your sensor interface, right? So all the buttons you see on our demo board that I'm passing around for selecting red, green, blue, they're all round uh, in, in shape. So they, are, they typically work the best. So this is, uh, uh, let me show you a, a, a demo board for our single channel device. This one actually, on the demo board, we give you three different sensor plates, as you can see, three different sizes. These three are three different sensor plates that you can see. It, it shows you nicely what the size of a sensor plate does to your overall performance. So the, the bigger the sensor plate, the more distance you can support, the more you are going to conduct. You know? So basically, it all boils down to the area of your sensor plate. Okay. So one more thing. So touch sensing through metal enclosure. So a lot of the, you know, the white goods, a lot of the industrial design have metal on top of everything. And you still want to do a touch through the, through the metal enclosure. So you need to take uh, care of what, it, what is between your, basically between your PCB and, and the steel. So, the mechanism is, you know, you, there is some dielectric put between the steel and the PCB so that it will conduct. When you touch the steel and that steel is thin enough for it to conduct, detect that touch, and, and send that signal all the way through the dielectric to the PCB. So basically, if, you are, if your design includes a metal enclosure, again, you need to take special care and account for, for, for that uh, uh, metal enclosure as well. Now, how do you increase the sensing range? So typically, like with this board, you can, you can do like maybe five inches or, or two inches or three inches kind of proximity detection. But what if you want to increase your, your range? 
So one simple way to increase it by, is by putting a voltage follower uh, in the path, which is kind of going to redrive your signal and, and, and basically reinforce your signal. But the downside of this is, you know, these are pretty power sensitive applications typically. You don't want to burn too much power on these. But when you use this, this op amp is going to be always on, and that is going to conduct extra power. So now you're going to spend more power, and that depends on what op amp you selected. But the downside of increasing your range this way is your power budget. You know, you, you're going to spend more on your uh, power. But theoretically, it is possible to basically extend your range uh, by, by doing such tweaks on the path. So maximize sensor plate area for the highest possible sensitivity. So the more sensitive you want your design, you want the maximum possible sensor area in your design. The separation to ground is you know, typically around 2 mm. So these are just some of the best practices on how we do demo boards and what we all learned uh, in our lab. Uh, the sensor plate diameter is uh, you know, typically the overlay thickness plus 8 mm. So basically, the diameter of your sensor plate should be bigger than the thickness of your overlay material, you know, typically which is glass or some sort of overlay. Right? Um, the ground on top layer should be hatched uh, you know, instead of a big solid fill. And ground separation for traces should be as small as possible for noise immunity. And very long traces should be avoided because they are going to build up their own capacitance on the path. So, uh, and then as I mentioned before, uh, all the other controllers and other uh, devices should be mounted on the bottom of the PCB and not on the sensing side, where your sensor is, is to reduce, again, all the electrical interferences. And that includes you know, all the signals like your I squared C spy, everything that you are routing, uh, you know, anything that is a sharp edge, you know, which is going to be a high, low signal, uh, you know, should be at least 4 mm away from all the other traces or lines, again, to reduce the, the interferences. And if communication signals and sensor signals are crossing each other, you know, then you should make sure that they're crossing at right angles. And again, this would reduce basically the mutual conductance between the two if they are at right angles, all those traces. Right? So these are just some best practices to follow when you're doing your uh, design with a capacitive uh, that sensor. So this is uh, uh, an evaluation board for PCF 8883. It's a, uh, it's uh, can even power it off a, a, a battery. And uh, as I mentioned, it's a very simple, uh, very simple device um, uh, to do like an on-off, to implement like an on-off switch or a simple proximity-based or touch-based on-off switch. And it is one of the lowest power solution in its class. I think it's like some nanoamps of uh, current consumption. Uh, with a very wide VDD support voltage range. Uh, it also supports three different kinds of operating modes, like push button, toggle, or, or, or a pulse. So you can set what you want with a special input called type input. But basically, depending on how you configure, every time you touch, either it can behave like a push button, or it can behave like a toggle switch, or it can output a fixed amount of pulse every time you touch it, every time it is activated. So this feature is pretty. Uh, helpful to, real, to realize different types of uh, uh, you know, experiences for your product. You know? uh, this is another application, and you might have seen some of in your actual life, you know, your, the, the car door handles. Now, when you go near them, it automatically unlocks and opens the door, and that is, again, done with capacitive sensing. So we actually have a reference design uh, using our device on how you can do a car door. So these are some of the newer applications where we are seeing touch and proximity kind of applications. This is the application board that I'm passing around. It's a multi-channel. It's a demo board for our multi-channel device. And, you know, and this is the breakdown. So it is using eight sensors for this uh, circular wheel. It is using eight channel to eight sensors to implement the slider. So all of this is being realized using just one device. right? And this kind of goes into more detail on, you know, on how it is scanning over I squared C, what mode it is scanning in. Uh, but we have a several very useful application notes on our website that you can uh, you know, refer to. And it also has more details on some of these design considerations that I just talked about. Okay. So uh, it goes in much more detail on some of these different aspects. 
Uh, this is yet another kind of uh, uh, reference design uh, for an infotainment control panel. So you can see, you know, kind of a front panel of your car kind of thing where you can press different switches and activate different controls. Uh, and this is, we are running with our, the demo board as a base and uh, or a flex cable we are controlling and uh, monitoring all these buttons. So this is yet another reference design, uh, you know, that we have uh, created. Um, this is uh, another evaluation board uh, for the same multi-channel device, but this is where you want to do uh, write some I2C code or USB, and you can hook up USB to I2C dongle and really run it with your own code. Then you can use some of these uh, uh, demo boards. This particular one is the touch panel demonstrator that I talked about. It is this very board. And it is, a, it is a big design. It uses NXP LPC microcontroller inside as a main master. It uses our multi-channel device. All of these things you see here are done using our multi-channel device. So you can do off, on, you can up, down your temperature, or you know, set the fan speed, or change the mode where you are receiving the air. So it's just a demo design. Um, and in this one, there is another unique thing that we have done. Uh, remember how our multi-channel device had a I squared C interface on it, and it can, it can detect up to 28 sensors? This one uses two of those, and since it's an I squared C, they both can be hooked up together in a master-slave mode. So using two of them, we are actually doing up to 64 sensors. You can do up to 64 sensors using just two devices. One will behave like a master, one is a slave, and they are both hooked up onto the same I squared C bot. The beauty is that it's a simple I squared C interface, so you can support so many more sensors using just uh, two devices. So this kind of just isolates what are the different layers in this board. So there is a LPC base board. Uh, then, of course, there is a display. Then there is the, the sensor board, the PCF8885 uh, uh, 8885 sensor board. Uh, and then there is a master evaluation board. So there are so many boards all uh, layered on top of each other. So what I want to highlight here is that not only on a PCB kind of design, but you, know, you can also use these devices to do touch over glass you know, or, or LCD. And there are several different ways. So one is like an outside LCD, so which is the technology used on the, this particular demo board, uh, where, the, as you can see, the, the LCD layer, the glass, is the outermost layer in the whole stack. But then there's a couple of other technologies called on-cell and in-cell as well. And they all differ in terms of where the glass is versus the IT or touch layer. You know? And, and the, the key message here is, uh, no matter what kind of technology you choose or you want to support, you can still use some of these NXP devices uh, and the base to do your capacity of sensing. So for example, uh, on the on-cell technology, basically it is a simpler structure than, a, than this one with the outermost uh, LCD on the outside most. It, it becomes, the design becomes less thin and there are less number of layers. And in in-cell, there are even less number of layers than the on-cell because of the shared ITO layer. So this all boils down to your overall layer and what kind of overlay you have. But no matter what, you can still support uh, capacitive sensing. And this just shows three different kinds of demos, uh, each supporting the respective technologies that we have made to show how you can do such designs. Um, so this is... Uh, and lastly, I will uh, conclude by saying that there are several very useful informational videos uh, online, and I will highly refer you to some of the application notes on NXP website, and, and particularly the, the one application note, uh, 1082. Uh, I think I'm missing a four. It's 1082.4. It's very useful uh, and talks about some of these parameters that I talked about you know, at, a, at a base level today, but it goes in much more detail and it talks about every aspect of capacitive uh, uh, design. So that concludes my uh, presentation.